As I've told you, my name is Dr. Steve Somerton. I'm a uh, practicing uh, gastroenterologist in uh, Brantford, Ontario, in private practice since 1983. Uh, I do uh, head up the gastrointestinal endoscopy program at the Brantford General Hospital. I'm medical liaison to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for our local chapter, and I do occasionally train uh, students and residents in gastrointestinal uh, uh, rotations. Um, so therefore, my objectives uh, this evening is to describe the symptoms and diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, discuss the epidemiology, which means the patterns, causes, and effects of the condition, outline possible uh, treatment options as well. The slide's a bit busy, but uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, irritable bowel has a, um, a distinction in that there are a number of interactions between causes and effect. And in fact, uh, work, seminal work through the 70s uh, in the UK and also in Canada showed that in fact older terminologies such as spastic colon or mucous colitis were inappropriate and also didn't describe the condition because in actual fact if you think about how you feel when things are going well and you're happy and, 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 and all is well, you have a certain amount of behaviors and also a certain amount of responses to your environment. And when things aren't going well, you have quite different responses. And so far, so far the bowel could be considered that way when the, when the word irritable is used to describe it. And it's not just the colon. We know from experience and from research that in fact it's other parts of the gastrointestinal tract and sometimes not the gastrointestinal tract that also are participating in the, in the entire syndrome. So bowel means more than just the colon. And syndrome is the word that's used to describe a, constellations of, a constellation of signs and symptoms that describe the condition that you're, you're relating to. So it's a syndrome, a collection of observations, signs, and symptoms. So we, have, we know there are a number of triggers in the diet. We've also learned from Dr. Federick, Federick earlier this evening that the microbiome now is becoming much more uh, of a, uh, uh, a legion member of uh, of uh, things that occur inside the body and occur inside the GI tract which can affect outcomes. It can also affect uh, behaviors and behaviors can also affect the GI tract. So the irritable bowel syndrome is a condition that can be associated with a number of signs and symptoms. Abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, incomplete emptying and mucus. And this is in the face of no obvious or specific structural or biochemical abnormality although that landscape is obviously changing from some things we've already heard earlier. Up to 20% of adults uh, can experience the irritable bowel type symptoms and, and uh, therefore the majority of folks actually don't seek attention and uh, some of those are just those who accept the fact that uh, this is the way it is and it's not incapacitating them, it's not associated with loss of function or loss of productivity, loss from time from work or school. But those who are having more difficulty will seek out attention, usually through the family physician and then some, sometimes referred on. So we see just, a, we just capture as specialists just a, a fraction of these folks. Females are twice as likely to be dis diagnosed as males and uh, constipation tends to be more of a problem there. And it's the second most common reason for missing work with uh, influenza being number one. So it's a clinical diagnosis, which means basically what really matters is when you meet the individual who's coming to see you for your opinion, that you take the time to listen carefully. And you know it's not gonna be just one visit, in all likelihood. It's gonna take a bit of time to sort of sort through all the important bits of information that matter if you're gonna make a positive diagnosis of the irritable bowel. We can talk about that a little bit in the uh, discussion period. Uh, there are tests that are occasionally done. I'll go, go, back, uh, go back to that in a minute with the next slide or two. And there are numerous attempts uh, to try and get a consensus as to what uh, the, the symptoms and signs should be, uh, primarily for the entrance into clinical trials, but uh, occasionally also uh, for clinical work uh, that uh, involves office work. So basically, within six months of, of a diagnosis, there should be the following scene, three days per month or so, where the... Uh, where the patient, sorry, the recurrent abdominal pain that's at least three days per month and two or th out of three of the next. Uh, change in bowel function, uh, change in appearance of the stool, and an improvement in symptoms after defecation. I think I'll skip that, although that's, uh, that may be humorous. You know what that is? Okay, that is a stool chart. It was uh, published in the mid-1990s by the group in Bristol. Uh, I th it's probably also more for, uh, for a research tool than it is for a practical tool. And quite often people come to see me, they've got their iPhones. This is the age where they just say, here it is, doc, see what I did this morning. <laughs> what, can be, what can be worrisome symptoms? Uh, worrisome symptoms, of course, uh, onset over age 50, weight loss, 
blood in the so-called alarm or red flag signs, fever, perhaps fever associated with abdominal pain, not just fever by itself, nausea, vomiting, we mentioned that occasionally uh, other signs and symptoms of irritable bowel uh, can, can come on with nausea or biliary uh, dysfunction, but in fact, if you have nausea, vomiting and weight loss and other such things, you'd be a little bit more concerned. Diarrhea that's inappropriate or it's new or, or comes on at uh, odd times of the day where it uh, normally would not. And there may be a number of tests that would be required to investigate these things, including endoscopy. The exact cause of the condition, as I mentioned earlier, is not known, although I think th this presentation may be, become quite archaic in the next couple of years, as I think we're going to learn a lot of stuff. Altered motility is, is definitely noted for a number of uh, factors, including the microbiome. Um, this can follow gastrointestinal infections. Uh, uh, that's so-called post-infectious irritable bowel, where in fact the bacterium or, or the agent that's caused the problem is cured and removed, but the patient still lingers with abnormal symptoms uh, and don't return to their normal bowel function. Various food intolerances, bacterial overgrowth, which is usually in the small intestine and can be treated with certain antibiotics, and a lower pain threshold, uh, which also can be moderated perhaps by the microbiome. We've done that. How do we treat it? Uh, very, very briefly, there are a number of options for treatment, but there's no absolute effective treatment. But one of the most important things also, as I mentioned at the outset, is to, to take a very careful history. This is where the money is. You have to listen. You have to get clues and hints from the, from the, uh, the history as to where to go in terms of uh, subsequent uh, attempts at treatment. Dietary modifications are sometimes helpful. A food log can help. Uh, increased fiber depends uh, quite often on the presentation. Some people with irritable bowel have more diarrhea, some have more constipation, some have a mixture of both or vacillate between the two. So you've got to choose your fiber properly, soluble versus insoluble, to make sure you don't make things worse. Lifestyle modifications as, as seen fit and certain behavior modifications. Certain medications are available. Uh, none are totally effective. They're basically aimed at symptoms, including antispasmodics, antidiarrheals, laxatives, low-dose antidepressant medication, beware and antibiotics where appropriate. So in summary, irritable bowel syndrome is characterized by a variety of symptoms including abdominal pain, bloating, and alter alternating constipation, diarrhea. Uh, it affects about 15 to 20 percent of all adults. Its, di its diagnosis is primarily based on symptoms. The exact cause is unknown, but altered bowel motility, previous infection, food intolerance, and stress and anxiety. I didn't talk much about that, but that's a huge component to this problem. It's not a condition that leads to cancer or life-threatening illness, and therefore patients really need to be reassured that they're okay. And treatment is aimed at preventing uh, or relieving symptoms, as we've mentioned. Thank you so much for your attention.